Welcome back to the live stream lounge. We're here at the primetime hour. I'm Ray Latif, the managing editor of BevNet. I'm going, joined by John Craven, he's the founder and CEO. And we're joined by the one and only Marcus Antebi, the founder of Juice Press. How are you, Marcus? I'm great. Thanks a lot for having me here. I appreciate well, being so here. Thanks so much for being here. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about Juice Press and you know, your background in starting the company? Okay. Um, well, I've been in retail since I'm um, 10 years old, so it's no, I'm no stranger to retail. Um, I fought competitive Thai boxing for a number of years, and I was um, cutting weight and exercising at a very high, uh, high level six days a week. So it was necessary for me to find a secret weapon for my nutrition. And some of the older fighters taught me how to use juice and smoothies as a way of getting the calories that I needed without um, overdoing the calories. But there was something else happening at the time to my chemistry, which I wasn't aware of until I got into the industry. When I retired from Thai boxing and got out of my family business, I, I was sitting around trying to figure out what to do next. And um, this, I've had this juice idea in my head for a number of years. So um, a location became available on East First Street. And I, I wanted the location more than I wanted to be in business. I just thought it was the coolest retail location in New York. So I found myself executing a lease and then saying, oh my God, what am I gonna do with this store? Um, everything that I did at Juice Press early on came very natural to me because of my background in retail, very complicated retail. I had a, a, a very complicated skydiving equipment company for eight years and um, because I understood the product so well, it, everything just flowed and, and, and it was a natural progression. So Juice Press today, where we're at right now is we have um, 42, Retail stores open in mostly in Manhattan, but we're in Southampton, East Hampton, Bridgehampton. We have stores in Brooklyn. We're in Connecticut, New Jersey, and Massachusetts and Boston. So um, by the end of the year, we'll have about 52 stores. Thanks for coming to Massachusetts, by the way. Okay, thank so, you. Thank you for coming it's to Massachusetts. It's kind of hard even with this mic to hear you with all the background noise. <laughs> yeah, a little crazy in here. Yeah. Um, can, so they, can they hear me okay? So let's get to the uh, you know sort of elephant in the room about HPP. Uh, okay. which is the lack of HPP. And just kind of without, you know, I know you, you say you can get into sort of science and whatnot on a lot of the products and stuff in your space. You know, just kind of give us the simple, you know, your approach and why you've done what you've done. Well, um, everybody I think understands what HPP as a process is and what it does is, is definitely um, a better process than heat pasteurization. Um, I think that for Juice Press, uh, the one thing that we're, that, we, that we're doing is we're doing everything the hard way. You know, when you open a store like this, if you look at my, my closest competitors, they have maybe 20 SKUs in their refrigerator. We have about 70, and we're, we're, we're attached to all of them. We're not actually discontinuing it, and we're just adding on to the list, which is hard. And we've, we've, over six years, mastered the art form of predicting what we're supposed to build as an inventory on a daily basis without having waste that kills us. So our waste levels are incredibly low, um, somewhere between four and 5% of our, of our bottles that we make, which is incredible. Um, so the first thing everyone understands that the kill step is required for somebody who's doing a wholesale of juice. So it's definitely the method to use over other methods that are available the problem that I have with HPP as a consumer is that I don't like the taste of a juice once it's past three or four days. And I've tested HPP myself because I'm concerned of having a, um, a, protect, a protection in place if the FDA changes the laws about a company my size with a centralized kitchen. I don't want to just be caught with my pants down. So I did a lot of research on my own, figuring out what can be done. and. What I discovered about HPP is that at full pressure, my, most of my juices actually taste pretty good two or three days after the HPP process is done. On the fourth and fifth day, the, the taste of it just goes right into the toilet. And I don't want to design formulations to work on HPP. I want to design formulations for people's chemistry and for the benefits that you know, a raw fresh juice would have. So, that's really where we're at right now with HPP and why we use HPP, why we don't use HPP. What I did discover actually is that um, if, I if I was required to use HPP, I would probably 
recoin the term HPP, I would change it to LPP. I would call it low pressure pasteurization and I would use the lowest possible setting to the, whatever the lowest possible setting is for that particular formulation to achieve the, the five log reduction and then I wouldn't have the shelf life. So I would still be the shortest shelf life but I'd be able to sell the product wherever I needed to sell the product and likely not in a wholesale environment. So that's, that's something if I had to do it by law and that was the business model, I figured out how to do that. So I could keep the taste, have the kill step, and, 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 and still you know, be able to function within the, 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 the program that I'm looking to do. And is wholesale distribution part of the plan for Juice Press? I mean, it's not part of what you're doing right now, right? Well, we don't wholesale, obviously, because we're not achieving the five log reduction. And um, we're, we're building a retail brand and with what we have going on, it's not really possible to do both at the same time. I think um, it's, it, when, you, when you think about it, if I was a wholesale brand, it would be nearly impossible for me to then say, I want to become a retail brand. As, so as a retail brand, it's definitely an exit strategy or somewhere in the middle or the three-quarter way down the road where we can say, okay, now we have 100 SKUs and, and 10 of them are so widely accepted and we're ready to create a supermarket line and concentrate on that. And, and, and um, we definitely want to do that. We have beverages now that we feel would be ideal for a supermarket brand. They're, they're products that I don't think people are going to for optimal health. They're going to them as a better decision. So for example, we have an amazing cold brewed coffee line that uses fresh almond milk, for example. I don't think people think of that the same way they think of a green sure. juice. So having a product line like that, that we HPP, and that's a $5 product in the supermarket, is really a, it's really a great entry into the, into the um, wholesale business. It's a great entry level to the wholesale business. Um, you know, and HPP and Cold Press Juice have been on quite a run the last three or four years. You know, where do you see the category as it is today, and where do you see the category over the next three or four years? Um, I think the one thing that we all have in common in this industry is we have to, uh, together, figure out a way to educate the consumer about what they're eating and avoiding processed food. So anyone that's in the beverage industry that's using highly processed ingredients would not really be someone that I'd be a good person to talk to. But the people that are trying to create a high vibration, high energy uh, product that, you know, um, just by nature of the fact of hydration is a reduction of inflammation and they're using ingredients like ginger and turmeric and um, plant-based products and they're not using uh, you know, processed refined sugars. We're all kind of on the same team because we're, we're taking away um, one of the biggest problems in the Western diet, which is processed food. So as we, uh, today, as an, as, an, as an example, in the, in, the, uh, in the New York Post, the, uh, the, the Mets pitcher, uh, Noah Syndergaard, there's a big spread on him about how much juice he's drinking and that his trainer and everyone that's around him is promoting a very low inflammation diet. And he's saying outright that juice is a big part of his regimen. The more things that we get like that in our industry, the, the larger this category is going to grow. So um, for Juice Press, you know, it's all about really... Um, creating um, enough, enough uh, range in our SKU price points. Because we know if, if my green juices were not $11, if they were $5, I'd have 1,000 stores. So for me, the, the, the more I can have um, premium products that don't compromise the integrity, but allow people to buy into the brand. For example, we have a line of functional waters at Juice Press. Um, for example, we have an aloe water we have a probiotic water, we have a vitamin D water, a vitamin C water, we have a rose water, and we're expanding those lines. They're all $3 items. They're functional. They actually have benefits, and it's actually water. So I, if I was in the industry right now, in, in the wholesale industry, I would really try to get, uh, I would concentrate on delivering real products that can be functional and deliver a slightly more than just hydration. And so, you know, Admittedly, though, not all juices are created equal. And, you know, you focus very heavily on providing high nutritional content in all your products, including probiotics. Right. 
And probiotics are a really big thing. You infuse them in all your juices. Why do you feel probiotics are such a, an important part of the diet at this point? Well, in the case of the probiotic that I'm using, which is a brand called Probiotic, which is a, a sister company to Juice Press, that particular strain, uh, which it's, L, it's called uh, GLB-44, um, also known as L. bulgaricus, this particular strain of bacteria, we originally started with it to use it as a supplement only, to sell it as a, a probiotic supplement. It's a vegan probiotic, it comes from a flower, and it grows in carrot or green juice. It doesn't need a dairy medium, and it's not a probiotic derived from an animal source. We would have been very happy with it if that was the only thing it did was, a, was, was be a supplement. We started testing it, and we did a, a, a study with Sofia University in Bulgaria, and also a study with Harvard, and we accidentally discovered that one capsule, which is a single dose, in a bottle of juice, could destroy E. coli, Listeria, and Salmonella, which obviously was an epic discovery. And um, we've been testing it, and we have conclusive evidence that it does that. The, the condition is very simple. If you take one dose of the bacteria and you put it in the juice and you add the pathogens, and it's, it has to be refrigerated, it takes 20 hours, 100% mitigation of Salmonella and Listeria, 100%. And 99.875 of E. coli. And there's three or four other foodborne pathogens that this strain destroyed. There's no other bacteria that's a probiotic that's FDA approved that does that because we've tested with it, we've done the same test with other um, bacteria. So, what we're doing now at Juice Press for our own peace of mind, obviously, we have a lot of money tied up in Juice Press, is we're adding that probiotic to every juice. So, it's actually, we're not only making our juice. Um, as a, we're making the juice with an added probiotic without having to take dairy, which is the most common way people do it. But we're also, for us, we're making the juice safer from those, those pathogens. There's nobody else that could make that claim. There's no other probiotic available. We have an exclusive on that. And we also, I believe that we still have a patent pending on the mechanism of using this strain of bacteria in a juice to kill those bacteria. And I guess one last question. Yes. Um, you've got 70, I think you said 70 flavors of, of right. juices now. How did you end up with so many? And I, I guess, is there kind of a right number that you're going for? I don't mean that in a negative way. No, I, I agree. You know, um, when, when, you, when you think about the obstacle that we had to overcome in Juice Press, just in New York, the obstacle is even bigger in cities that are used to a juice bar where you walk in and you just basically create your own juice on a rotary machine. So very early on when I started Juice Press, it was a big problem for me because I had to direct people from what they would think is a traditional way of getting a juice and I had to say, no, if you get it in the bottle, it's better. So in order for me to actually keep the audience interested, there has to be no way that I don't have something that they want or like. So the SKUs were always very cluttered and confusing from the start. As we um, started to build out, we really learned that the, 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 the high amount of SKUs that we have really is why a, that we created a lifestyle brand and not just like, oh, I'm going to go to a juice bar once a week. You can't really get bored with the offering that I have between the bottled smoothies, um, the, 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 um, the ginger and the turmeric drinks, the coffee beverages, the coconut waters, you know, and the green juices and the fruit juices. There's such a wide variety that you can't get bored. You can come to Juice Press three times a day and always feel like you're having a, a unique experience. So that works for us. Outstanding. Well, Thank you very much. Marcus, we're out of time, but this has been incredible. So thanks so much for being with us. And Thank you very uh, much. look forward to seeing more Juice Press in Boston. Thanks, thanks Marcus. Thank you. Thank you.